we're so excited. We have the three biggest VCs in the region on stage with me. So give a proper round of applause for Khaled from Wamda, Danny from Beko, and Walid from MEVP, please. Yalla, ya shabib, ma'anna wait. Jayin, Jay. I'm here. Well done. Are we all mic'd up? We're yeah. all mic. Okay, yep. great. So, uh, hey, that. <laughs> so take your Snapchats, Instagram, tag everybody. We're gonna just skip the introductions at this point because if you don't know Wanda, MEVP, or Beko, then I don't know what you've been doing in the startup space at all. I mean, you should be hearing uh, about these VCs on a regular basis. They, between them, they've made, I think we just calculated about 75 investments, 74 investments, and invested over uh, a billion dollars. 100, 100 million. million, yeah, right? Yeah, a billion sounded strange. No, not there yet. Million dollars. <laughs> uh, in regional startups. So we're gonna jump right into it, okay? And feel free to Google their profiles if you really are curious. Uh, but I think the most exciting point is to get these three boys on a couch and to get them to really talk about, um, you know, you all started in the VC space with the exception of MVP, but pretty much uh, within the last five years you've, you've launched. Now I'm wondering what are the biggest, you know, challenges that you already knew it was going to be difficult because five years ago there wasn't that big of a tech scene at the time. So in catching up with the tech scene, what are the biggest challenges that you had to overcome as VCs yourself? And kind of what are the, what are the structures that you've put in place to overcome those? Um, open, open answer. Well, I think, I think when we started um, a few years ago, I mean, just being in VC, not Wamda per se, but I think the, the three of us actually owe our start from, um, in this kind of asset class from uh, the Arab Business Angels Network. So, Walid Hanna, who started, at, who started MEVP, um, was there. And Amir Farha, who co-founded uh, Beko with Danny. Who's right my, there. Who's right there. And myself, we started, uh, we started in 2007 at ABAN, which was the first kind of angel investment vehicle in the region. At that time, there was absolutely nothing in tech in the region. There was no, there was no, there was no interest, there were no companies, there was very little. Um, and the biggest challenge at the time, and, and, and remains a challenge, is when you go to pitch the asset class, you go to, to pitch the concept of VC to investors, um, you know, they look at you funny. They say, well, why should I invest in this, in, in this kind of highly risky space? Technology is never gonna happen in the region. How do I, how do I make a return? Why, why should I take up all this risk when it's much easier for me to invest in real estate? And that's been the number one challenge for a long time. And with the success of companies like Souq and Karim, we're just beginning to see that shift. And so like, that's making our lives a bit easier. But the main challenge has always been evangelizing for what we do um, and, 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 and getting people interested in what we do. I think so I think our experience was a little bit different because when we went out and raised um, three years ago, focused on, can everyone hear me all right? We focused on um, high net worth individuals that we knew uh, from a fundraising perspective. So, it's, it, I mean, it's never easy, but it was much easier than it is today, given we are now uh, raising institutions, uh, some wealth funds, etc. So for us, actually, it's become a little bit more difficult because it's a new audience uh, as we institutionalize and scale up our capital base. What is uh, a lot easier, not that you've asked the question, is, <laughs> is just, you know, I mean, look at this deal flow, right? This, is, this, it, this event is, I think, five years old. Yeah. Uh, I, I wasn't here five years ago. I was here last year and uh, I think the year before, and it's obviously grown, and the, the ecosystem has significantly grown, and that's what we need to be able to, to find those amazing people building great businesses. Yeah. I'd say the biggest challenge that we're facing, besides uh, obviously convincing people that th this is a viable asset class, like Khalid called it, is actually money. We need a lot of money uh, in order to build an industry. Okay, if you put one, you can't expect to have a thousand out of uh, one investment. Right, so there's always a, a scale issue here. Um, we need, I was, we're doing some math with my team in, 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 at MEVP, and uh, we, we were just trying to compare ourselves with uh, European countries or, or India in terms of uh, availability of venture capital uh, pegged to, say, GDP per capita. And we realized that actually we need, in order to be 
equivalent to a country like France, which is a good country on its way to becoming an innovation in a global innovation hub, we need eight times the money that we have today. Eight times today in 2017. Actually, and that, that's going to be even accelerating at, so, at the bigger So thing. here's the data. We, in, in the MENA region, are at about $2 uh, of venture capital dollars invested per capita. Uh, India is approximately 10. China is up at 20. And the US is up at $250 per capita. I mean, it's off the charts. So, so exactly. And by the way, when you compare to China and India or Latin America or Southeast Asia, these sort of economic blocks that are very similar to us in, in, in demographics, we actually have six times the purchasing power parity than these other blocks that we're comparing to. Forget about France. So if they're already 5 to 10x our size in spend per capita and we have 6x their ability to buy services and, uh, and goods and services as enterprise or consumers, we should be by an order of magnitude exactly. 50x. So we should be investing $5 billion in 2017 in venture capital across the region if we want to call this industry an industry. Right, but <laughs> so scale. what are you guys doing? What are you guys doing to actually get there? We're, you know what I mean? We're, we're, Are you we're just waking up every day, evangelizing, working on returns, trying to build companies, help companies scale, bring them investors, do, do follow-up rounds, invite, invite other investors, have teams who actually liaise with the founding teams if, if they have any problem with regards to product, to strategy, to go to market. We do synergies between portfolio companies. We have them if they need an accountant or a CFO, so if they're think, looking for, should I stop? Like because I can continue. Do you feel, I know you can continue, I know, that, but do you feel like you're fighting an uphill battle? Yes. Yes, it's not easy. It's very difficult. It is extremely difficult to prove returns to somebody who's sitting in front of you and is used to see an IRR out of other funds they put, it, they put money in in, in, what, what, in Silicon Valley or any of the or you know, even, development. Even in like an alternative asset. So you know, you're, you're, you're really competing for the same um, allocation of resources against you know, real estate, against uh, public portfolio, against like, all kinds of different assets. And you're kind of stacking up against that, and you have to kind of sell a dream, basically. But I think, I mean, to your point about is this an uphill battle, I think it, it most certainly is. This is a very, very difficult industry. This is um, incredibly challenging. But I think the road's getting easier, and I think the reason why the road is getting easier is because we're more and more people, like the people in the audience, are coming out of their very talented people are leaving their, their more kind of secure jobs and, and starting great businesses. And this... This is kind of a tipping point for the region. It's a, it's a great paradigm shift in the way we, in the way kind of entrepreneurship is taking out, is, is taking place. It's not the kids coming out of college, you know, just kind of with their first experience starting businesses. Even though, I mean, that's great too. Um, but you're seeing career people from from kind of blue chip companies with solid corporate experience coming and from government experience, etc., coming out and saying, you know, I wanna I wanna take a bet. I wanna start a business. And, and, and these are really talented people that we can work with, and we help them kind of build great businesses. And that's, that's, the, that's, that's, what, that's what's making our lives much easier. So I totally agree, but I think it's a balance. And if it's too easy to raise money for us, it'll probably be too easy for entrepreneurs to raise money because it's a chain at the end of the day. And so we have to find that right balance. I would love it to be a lot easier. I totally agree. But I think it's good that it, if it was easy, everyone would be doing it. That's, I think, the bottom line. I'm sure it feels like everyone. Sorry, I don't know if you can hear me. Uh, I feel like everyone and their mothers are trying to raise money now, and every other person that I speak to is launching a fund of some kind, left or right, and they feel like it's so easy for them to raise money, and you forget that VCs actually have a really, really difficult job, not just raising money, but raising their next round, when the traction isn't necessarily as fast as in the US or as in yeah. Europe. Um, so really, how do you prove the successes portfolio you know what I mean do you need a souk or a Karim in your portfolio or are you really banking on those you know companies that are making maybe 50 million dollars a year or a hundred or a hundred million dollar valuations I think it depends on the investor uh, you've got the strategic investors who look at the region and want to understand can Mina uh, absorb a certain amount of entrepreneurial activity and therefore funding and that's sort of a very macro view, and it's a very difficult one to answer, and we're actually trying to answer it for a few of our <laughs> conversations with the, some of the large investors. Um, I guess the more tactical guys who want uh, you know, returns more than anything else, and shorter term returns than patient capital, which is sovereign wealth funds, 
are the guys who want to see a Karim in the portfolio or a soup that's, exit. But I think that's just true. Yeah, but just to, to build on your point, Danny, uh, there is an argument that is um, getting getting into shape. That's becoming, I think, a powerful argument today, which is because we invest in tech businesses, right? We don't invest in uh, non-tech businesses. Today, the, 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 world, the, the world is moving online and you have all these on-demand economies and e-commerce businesses and what have you, you know, that are disrupting media and telecom and retail and, and you name it. So the, the, the ignoring the, the, the power of online and digital businesses and shaping up existing industries is becoming more and more visible. And I think the acquisition of Amazon to sue is also a wake-up call for many uh, say uh, in the retail industry, for instance, whereby you have a world-class, we have basically America's largest retailer. Mm, I don't know if they surpassed Walmart or, or not yet, maybe yeah. on their way. Uh, they, have, they, have. they have, so yeah. buying into uh, you know, an e-commerce business, and that's gonna push retailers to rethink their strategies. And the same has happened in, 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 in media. And, and you know, take streaming, for example. What streaming has done for uh, the media industry is, is somehow um, equivalent. So the, the argument of an investor wanting to invest in the digital business becomes more relevant for those who actually know how to invest. So if you're in your portfolio, you have winning companies across the board, you will have lo losers, it's fine, it's part of the game. But if you have the knowledge to, to, to come and invest properly and explain what, is it to, what does it take to build a proper business, because uh, the businesses are not built overnight. Fadi explained that very well before. That becomes, I think, an interesting argument for the, the, the amount of, uh, for the traditional investors in MENA. Come and tell them, look, I mean, you're welcome to, do, to build the suit.com. Good luck, do it, it's great. But yeah. you know what, we could also maybe help in understanding e-commerce or maybe help in understanding that, that trend. So that's also a powerful yeah. argument that adds on top of returns and on top of... Uh, I think this kind of disruption in traditional industries, which is where a lot of concentration of wealth and capital is in the, in the Middle East, um, you know, to speak to your argument about kind of disruption in those spaces by tech, I think as, I think currently overall, I, we're seeing a lot of kind of the traditional businesses just waking up to the fact that technology is not this kind of neat separate category. It actually does. It's not an industry. It's, it's not an industry, industry, exactly. It is, you know, te technology enabled yeah. enterprises are bleeding into, you know, the entire spectrum of, 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 of areas and verticals. So I think um, once, once these companies start to feel the pinch a little bit by this disruption, when kind of Amazon starts disrupting the traditional retailers, when Netflix starts disrupting uh, broadcast, when a kind of digital content disrupts kind of newspapers, etc. listen, that's, but that's when they'll move. And I think they're just starting to feel it right now. You're describing the frog that sits in the boiling uh, pan yeah. and then doesn't realize it's getting exactly. that hot, and then it's dead when it's too late. It's exactly so. I mean, we speak to traditional businesses, traditional brick and mortar retailers, and, and all you know, in all the verticals. They're, you just said it. They're just waking up to the fact that this is a reality. Waking up today. We're in 2017, folks. You know, Amazon has overtaken Walmart. Walmart has been flatlining for the last decade. Have you seen the stock prices and the market share of Macy's and the likes? They've been decimated and mall operators, exactly, it's yeah. a disaster. And, and we're just talking about retail here. The same thing is, is happening across the board to a lot of other uh, verticals. So I think, yeah. and the problem with all the retailers is, you know, and I, we speak to all of them, is most of them are still thinking about it. There are very few who are actually realized, okay, I need to have a strategy now and I have to actually fund it and execute on it. And just one last thing, what they also don't realize, apart from the very few intelligent ones, so if there, if there are any retailers in the crowd here, please listen to this, is building a traditional brick and mortar business is a very different proposition from building the same retail proposition, but digitally. Yeah, you, a, yeah. and, and you see, we understand that because we've yeah. lived it, we've been in the trenches, we know that. Yeah. They just don't get it. And so they wanna, if they buy it, they'll, they'll, they'll destroy it. And if they invest in it, they'll probably also destroy it. The trick is, how do you give these people autonomy, let them just sit out there, do what they do so magically, and support them, rather than try and own yeah. them and put your fingerprints on them and, and make them brick and mortar DNA rather than digital DNA, yeah. which is an entirely different ballgame altogether. Uh, unfortunately, like too many, like with retail particularly, too many um, traditional retailers think about e-commerce as, okay, I'll just put a site and I'll, I'll just slap on a site and start selling my products online. 
And that's not the way it works. I mean, it's an incredibly complex proposition. It's so, very difficult to so get So Amazon, right. Amazon have, I've seen campaigns on Amazon in countries, like I think it was India, where they're only publicizing Amazon Prime. So, that, so they're actually presenting themselves as a media company, not as an oh, e-commerce okay. business. Sorry, guys, we can actually hear somebody else's mic coming through the microphone. I think it's just down. Somebody else is speaking in the background. <laughs> we'll have Sorry, to talk guys. louder and talk over them. Yeah. Okay, but this brings us to a really good point, right? So let's say hand holding versus autonomy. And even when you're investing in startups, how involved do you get into the startups that you invest in? Or how much are you just like, listen, we're going to just give you money, go rock with it, go build Can, your company? Do you mind? How much do you really have to help? I, do you mind? Before we move off this topic, I just want to log something as well with this audience so that you can all tweet about it and tell your friends and family and parents and kids and tell everybody about it. And tag Danny Farha when you tweet about tag it. Tag the ecosystem, guys. This is about the ecosystem. Is the most frustrating thing for us is when we go out fundraising to, with institutional investors is they tell us, go get an American or Western anchor and then come back to us. It's like we, as VC investors, tell you, go get Sequoia, you know, Andreessen, whoever, and, and then we'll follow. Duh. I mean, obviously, that's, it is incredibly <laughs> frustrating. Uh, tweet your hearts out. Yeah, but this is, this is where I want to draw the parallel between the companies that you're funding, right, and the struggles that they go through, and the same struggles that you guys go through, too. Because there's so similar. many times I mean, where companies here can't raise because they're like, okay, go, we're not going to fund you yet, but somebody else might in Europe, and if you get somebody from Europe, Hummingbird or whoever, by, then we're going to come. By essence, the venture capital industry is a proximity-driven industry. It's very difficult for us to invest in startups in China or Sweden or South Africa, or so at least at the early stage, because of the involvement question that you had. Now, our involvement is not a day-to-day -day operation or tell you how to run your business. Our involvement is at a different level. Um, it is very difficult to start a business, it's very difficult to scale a business, it's a lonely process, and it's good to have friends along the way. And those friends, they can give you introductions, they can give you money, they can give you more money in the future, or access to more funding in the future, they can give you, you know, uh, some shortcuts while you're navigating your tactics because they've seen stuff uh, in other companies, and all of that is kind of the um, summary of what, what a good venture capital can do. But uh, venture capital should not run a business. And that's something also I tell to, I, I'm actually very happy to see that there's a nascent angel investors uh, that are uh, uh, industry, but I can't call it an industry, but there's an, an angel in the investor uh, a promising industry uh, coming up. And it's, it's also my advice to you. I mean, at some point you have to help, but not run a business. I think, at the end of the yeah, day, it's when, when important you, this thing. Down. When you get to the point where you're running the business on behalf of the entrepreneur, or you're too involved, you've already lost that company. Yeah. Yeah. So um, it's critical that we kind of draw the line between kind of value add and making sure that the team is able to grow. Because you can as an investor, and this happens way too often in the region, you know, outside of these three funds with a lot of angels, um, where an early investor takes up a bit too much equity and then becomes the de facto driving force of the company uh, on top of management. Right. And that is incredibly destructive to value. And, and you see this over and over and over again in the region. So, so I think that's something. So I agree with you. I think it's getting the balance right, like everything uh, in life, part art, part science. Uh, I think one of the things that, that makes us very different from my uh, peers here is that most of the investment team, let alone the partners at Beko, are ex-entrepreneurs. Um, and so we really, we know we've been through this, some of us multiple times, in building these businesses. And so sometimes we just can't help but help. Uh, but beyond that, when we meet with entrepreneurs, we ask them, before we invest in them, what beyond the money would you like? And it's typically two or three things, and it's the same old chestnuts. And it's typically, help us access new markets get me into Saudi, get me into Egypt. And I know that that might sound easy. I mean, me into Saudi, get me into Egypt. It should be very easy. It's actually very, very, very difficult for, uh, for those of you who don't know. Uh, and I guess, you know, creating partnerships. In, in, in my uh, past experience when I was a tech entrepreneur, and actually Samir was sitting right here, one of the reasons why, one of the main reasons why we won was we did a partnership with Maktoub and they were able to give us traffic in a day when there was no Google and there was no Facebook. I was lucky I knew him. I mean, we were at college together, but if I didn't, 
uh, and I was 15 years younger and I had a Beko or a Wamda or somebody to connect me and help me manage that process, that for us was life changing and we've done that with a f quite a few of our portfolio companies. Okay, so to bring a question that you just asked to your startups, I mean, what do you guys want beyond the money, right? You obviously want LPs, but what do you guys look for as VCs? Yeah. What do you want? What do you want to happen? What's going to help think you? Before that, I think just on the point of kind of value add to the ecosystem and kind of philosophy of investing, um, I think we as VCs spend a lot of time talking about disruption, thinking, oh, we're going to invest in disruptive businesses. We're, we're thinking about how do we occupy the space within disruption. I think something we all need to be very cognizant of and something I think the entrepreneurs don't realize is that our business is being disrupted slowly but surely in, in these spaces. So um, if you think of what a VC fund is, we're just an intermediary between capital and where that capital is being delivered. We have to be able to figure out how to not only add value, but build intelligent networks around where we operate so that we can grow the ecosystem as a whole and then invest in the ecosystem. And that's why, for example, at WAMDA, we have the wider WAMDA platform. So the idea there is to, you know, how do you build the wider uh, ecosystem and build networks around that ecosystem that you figure out how to monetize around that. Um, so I think that's something we, you know, we, we need to think a bit more about and think as a, as a group, yeah. as a peer group, how do we evolve? And I think it's a good thing that capital. we have differentiated strategies so we complement each other. The worst thing would be if we all try to do the same thing yeah. for the ecosystem. So I, I've famously been listening to you guys' bromance for, <laughs> yeah. for a while. We, we all like each other very much. Yeah. I swear they were all hugging backstage and I kept saying, come on, you we, guys We always competing. hug. We're huggers. Uh, and high-fiving. Well, like we said at the beginning, um, we all start in the same place. So sure, we all yeah. go back I mean, a long way. I, I mean, exactly. All, 2006, 2007, there yeah. was um, you know, no industry and uh, I mean, a big bang happened. And like, I, yeah. I was lucky to be close to it. I was at Emirates Towers across the street. I was working for the government. But, what do I what do I want today? Okay, um, obviously I'm building a business, and it, it is a business, right? So it's a business, not a charity. But what I want, I want the change. I want to change the Arab world. I want the Arab world to be a technology powerhouse. I fundamentally believe in that uh, part of the world becoming a influential uh, influencing part of the 21st and 22nd century, right? And this is what I want. And why do I want that? Partially because, selfishly, I was born in 1979 in Beirut, in the darkest times of my country. And having gone through that very difficult, dark times myself, I came to the realization that, you, that the world belongs to those who stand firmly on their feet and fight firmly on their feet. They fight for a better world, they fight for a better future, they fight for a better home. They, they, and, and, and I fundamentally am convinced that we can pull it off, right? And how do we do it? We do it by, as Khalid explained, by becoming good vehicles of change. Putting money behind people just based on the fact that they are good, solid, honest entrepreneurs that can change their industries. And that's how we change the world. And this is what I want to see. Yeah. And I want to see it through running a proper business. Yeah, I think, I, yeah. Well. Like, I think to add to that, I think what drives me personally, um, and I think Walid put it very eloquently, I think share that 100%. I think to add to that, I would just say, you know, we, there's a lot of positivity in the region, there's a lot of good forward momentum, but we do have deep structural issues, either societal or economic. And I think by driving entrepreneurship and driving the development of great businesses, you help solve those problems because you enable the individual to own their own economic destiny. You're kind of driving people to kind of build, to, to kind of not be beholden to another actor, beholden to the state, beholden to anything, right? In a way, this is the most kind of revolutionary movement, entrepreneurship, that the, uh, that's being experienced in the Arab world. It is far more powerful than going out and protesting in the street. It is far more powerful than anything else. And you know, being a small agent of change, along with kind of these gentlemen, is, 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 been, is, is the most rewarding thing I'll ever do. So you guys, thank you. You've basically just stated our vision and mission statement. So um, I thank so you for that. You. But I think just <laughs> one, one little. Uh, Hello. Hello. Yeah. Okay. I'm back. Uh, just one little caveat. I think. What's really important, we all want to create an impact uh, and through impact generate significant returns. 
so that they can be recycled back into the ecosystem. But impact comes from the micro, micro uh, entrepreneurship. Thanks. Hello? Uh, impact doesn't come from a lot of micro entrepreneurship. So I heard the Endeavor and saw this report actually quite recently where Mexico has the largest number of companies in the world, uh, nominally, not just per capita, but they're all one and two mom and pop shops. So, you know, okay, fine, lots of economic activity, but if you look at the US, it has the largest number of large companies, and that is where impact happens. So we need to create more souks and more kareems and, um, you know, that type of extremely large company in order to create the impact we want on every front, from a jobs perspective, from creating a better, uh, a better environment, a better region, creating the wealth effect where a lot of these guys then recycle their funds and their time back into the ecosystem, and it has, it creates a nice big wheel. Yeah, on, on impact, I think it's very important to remember that the impact is driven by building great companies, not the other way around, right? So Kareem, for example, is a very impactful business in Saudi Arabia by enabling, by fixing a broken public uh, transport infrastructure uh, and enabling women to get to work, right, in a way that was not possible before, while also creating 70,000 jobs that didn't exist before, right? There's kind of huge... There's a great impact there, and the impact is driven by building a fantastic business. But just to, you, you asked a question. You said, what do we want yeah, what from our want? investors? So I think we want patience. No, not from your investors, because we know that you guys ah. want the money. But I mean, from the structure, right? From the ecosystem now, because you all started with Avon. Avon didn't do so well, and now you wanted, you know what, we're going to do it bigger, we're going to do it our way, we're going to launch our VCs. So what do you guys want to get back from the ecosystem? What do you guys want to see? What do you want to get from the government? What do you want to get from the entrepreneurs? So, um, I, from, the entre from, the entrepreneur from the entrepreneurs, I would love to see and continue seeing the passion that I've been very lucky to, to, to see in the, some of the amazing companies that we've worked with, Shahiya and Anrami and Luxury Closet and, and so many of those amazing companies that I've been doing a lot of things because of the passion. So passion is, is at the heart of what you do. Second, um, long term, very long term. There is no point in arguing over a, a, a structure of a deal because the Series A didn't happen the, the way you want it. You'll get it back at the Series B if things are really good. Um, that's so, so a, a, a bit of patience, and Danny touched on that patience. Also, with regards to uh, where are we in this together, I, I found I found that, that uh, uh, founders who are going in for the short short term too focused on the quick wins and the shortcuts fail. There are absolutely no shortcuts. The same way we didn't, we, we, we put in now almost 10 years of our lives in, in this in this. We didn't do it by, uh, you know. And, and third, from the governments, um, you know, I, I love governments. I, I have a uh, we have to. fantastic we, we all relationship love with all the governments. Especially our government here. Exactly. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, you like that I, plug? Tweet no, it. No, but, but we love the UAE government. We no, do, by the way. Exactly. And, 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 and to, the, to, the, to the people who are working for or in the government, um, I can see across the region and countries all over the region, including now, uh, you know, countries like Turkey, etc. There is finally a message, the message of hope, the message of change, the message of uh, economic empowerment has been received, right, by governments across the region. Now, my, my question, my, my, um, what I would like them to probably think about is how do you transform that, that that message into a practical structures where we still build good businesses and not necessarily again think on what country will will gain uh, uh, on, 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 on the shorter term by having this program um, or plan or not. This is a well, very well integrated region and entrepreneurship in this part of the world is integrated across countries. You have many yeah. companies who are based in Jordan and sell in Dubai and sell in Saudi and you have migrant workers coming from Egypt to here and you have you know, back offices in Lebanon and this is a very well integrated region. So the governments also should realize that uh, they cannot go and build entrepreneurship-driven policies and economies that, that put them in silos. And that's exactly. probably my message to those governments that, you know, just whatever you do in entrepreneurship, please help this ecosystem, but 
let's talk to us maybe we have some ideas and let's do it smartly yeah, and I think that's the power of Dubai in a way why Dubai works so well and why the government is always in Dubai is at the forefront of this kind of change because it's an open system right this is the promise of Dubai is you you come here from anywhere in the world but particularly from the region and you can build a business you can do whatever and it's kind of the melting pot it's kind of like a 21st century melting pot that's much more e effective than the original melting pot. It's still very expensive to start a business here, though. Right, right. But, that's, but that speaks to that integration point. Yeah. Like what? Have a back office yeah, in Amman. It's you, amazing yeah, talent. I think, yeah, and I, I, I'll echo what Walid was saying, is that you know, the, if there's something we can ask from governments, is that if you, if, if you really want to build this innovation ecosystem, then the way to do it is you know, you have to start cooperating and erasing the border in some degree, because that's the way, that's the way these businesses operate, right? Like, uh, you have to be able to arbitrage the labor market on the cost side, and you need to be able to kind of uh, arbitrage the commercial market, be, be able to kind of work on, uh, to sell in Saudi with a cost base that's in Amman or in Lebanon or Egypt. So I think so, that's So it. governments across the region, uh, first of all, should talk a lot more with each other. I think the problem we have is each government has its own little um, view of what to do and I think this is a, an economic block we cannot do it on our own Saudi can't do it on our on their own even though they're the biggest country in the region or second after Egypt we certainly can't do it on our own so I think and the three things that governments have in their control governments govern they create enabling environments and they create infrastructure and so policy education funding policy guys in America in 1992 they came up with something called the prudent man rule and the prudent man rule said endowment funds and pension funds and patient capital can now invest a prudent amount of their uh, assets under management in the venture capital asset class. Guess what happened? Boom. Floodgates opened. Money started flowing into the venture, venture asset class. And, you know, money has a very interesting way of finding its way to smart entrepreneurs like you guys to build amazing success stories. Uh, so that the second thing is bankruptcy law. They did that as well in I think 1978. They continue to refine it. We're still talking about bankruptcy laws in the region. Yeah. I know that Saudi recently rolled it out with the new companies law. We have to do a lot more, a lot faster. So that's the two things on policy. Uh, education, guys, we keep building towers. Let's build schools and universities and overhaul our educational curriculum. I see a lot of heads shaking in the, in the, and then if they don't do it, we have to do it as, as parents. And I, I, I'm a parent. So those of you who aren't a parent, get ready for uh, <laughs> parenting your own and educating your own kids extracurricularly if you have to. Um, and then the third thing is funding. Guys, governments are governments. They're supposed to provide funding to angel networks, to, you know, through matching investment programs. Take note, Wamina. <laughs> uh, they're supposed to invest in you know, managers like us, and then over time, those that uh, uh, produce value, whether it's returns and or impact, it, there's a consolidation play. You give more to the guys who meet your objectives. Uh, I think those are the very three yeah. simple. Yeah. Just don't invest and compete with us. That's, yeah. that's the bottom line on the funding part. Okay, well, thank you. We went a little bit over time, but I really appreciate it. And I'm actually really happy. I think everybody saw a really, um, Good amount of heart and soul coming from the guys who usually give them a hard time for a little bit of cash. So thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you.